This is True Multifamily, the show where we dive in on what really happens after closing a multifamily property. We're going to expose the role of asset manager. That's a person who has a responsibility of seeing the vision, executing the plan, and managing people, budgets, and timelines, all to deliver returns for our investors. These are the real struggles, the real victories, and the real stories of asset management. Welcome back to another episode of True Multifamily. I'm your host, Justin Fraser, here with Josh Eidingdon of, what is it, DXE Properties? Yes, exactly. Awesome. I nailed it. Josh, thank you for coming on the show today. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, we were just chatting before the show. We're in the same neck of the woods, kind of, by by the crow flies. Long Island and New Jersey are close. Uh, but as we mentioned, by drive time, it could be three hours or more. Right. Both both of us looking to leave New York and New Jersey, but one of us is going to do it sooner than the other. Yes, sir. Absolutely. On the way, on the way out of town here. Um, so, Josh, uh, our audience would love to know a little bit more about you before we get into your true multifamily stories. We want to hear just about your partnership and your portfolio and, and the types of investing that you're doing right now. Sure, I'd love to. Thanks. Um, so, it's great to be here. Uh, a little bit about myself and partnership. I'm the co-founder of DXE Properties. Um, we are located in the New York metro area, but most of what we own is multifamily in the southeast. Uh, we do have some experience in different asset classes. We've done a couple small condo developments. We do own some neighborhood shopping and retail. Um, but I'd say 98% of our, our focus and the acquisitions and what we've been pursuing has been multifamily. Predominantly, I, I'd say in the last six, seven years, what we've bought have been call it more workforce C-class product that we could renovate. Like we talked about before we started, we've been a little bit towards greater quality, mm -hmm. uh, even B and some A-class assets. We've been competing on better than a lot of the C-class stuff these days. Um, but most what, why do you think that is? I, I'm going to interrupt right in the middle of your bio here. Why yeah. do you think that you can, you the prices are different or what are you seeing on the A's that's different from the C's? You know, I, I think in terms of the A's, you, you, there's less levers to play with. Um, you know, maybe there's some lease loss, maybe there's some organic rent growth, but, you know, if you're talking an A-class product, it's something that's relatively recently built. Um, so there's not too much that you could do to, to move the needle in, in turn growth. So I, we've just, I, I think that for that reason, it's been just a smaller uh, variance of offer prices that you've been competing with. So it, maybe it's terms, maybe it's pushing the way it's structured, maybe it's accepting less returns than you might otherwise before right. to compete well in those deals versus some of the C-class stuff. Um, I just like, I have a difficult time, you know, like chasing and bidding 70s product in some of our markets that we're both in and paying mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, 90s a unit to put in another ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a unit. Yeah. And, and then chase an exit at, at almost replacement cost, you know, five, seven years down the line. So it's been tougher to justify, whereas in the past, we've been buying some of these C-class deals for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a unit. And it, it could just- <laughs> I fear those days are gone. Part. I fear, I fear the same. I good. do fear yeah. the same. You know, um, it, it's something we could probably debate all day because mm -hmm. I think it's going to be there. Like you're going to have that segment of the population that's going to need to rent for a long time. Yeah. But I, I just, I think we're seeing it across our portfolio, like collections have clearly suffered more on some of the more true C-class assets, yeah. the higher quality. Um, so it's, it's what we believe in, at least right now. Got it. All right. So I interrupted you. You were just getting into the types of properties that you buy. So, so that, that probably put a, a, a bow on it from multifamily. <laughs> um you know, we're, we're a newer company. We've been really active, I'd say, the last three years, myself and partner. Uh, my background, I worked for a software company. Then I worked for a real estate investment company as an analyst, then an acquisitions guy. Um, ultimately left them to, to start DXE with my partner, who comes from like a institutional development and construction management company in the city who just... Uh, had an entrepreneurial bug and was willing to leave his high paying job to make nothing with me. 
All right. <laughs> Let's find so, more of those. Uh, you know, with that, we try to bring, bring together two different worlds. Um, he takes much of the asset management, construction management. I'm doing the acquisition side, and we both come together on, um, call it equity and the financing side of the business. Um, you know, we're a group that's going to do deals a year, likely not more than that. Mm -hmm. um, we have been increasing deal size and much of that's maybe it's market, maybe it's just efficiencies of management. Um, but I did think an interesting deal that I could talk about today, maybe it ties into the most recent purchase um, was six years ago, we bought a 62 unit deal, um, really pretty strong sub-market of Cincinnati uh, and uh, actually ended up selling that earlier in 2020 and we did a 1031 into our most recent acquisition here in Atlanta. Yeah, I definitely want to get into that for sure. Um, let's, you know, you said that you partnered three years ago, but you said this deal was six years ago. Can you just give us some context? To, so who's involved in this deal from, from six years ago, the 63 years? Oh, this was a legacy me deal. Uh, okay. My partner came on board. So Is this something nice that stuff. you syndicated or you bought by yourself? What? A husband and wife team provided the equity for it. I basically did everything in between. Um, so I, I found the deal. I, I structured it, put it together asset management it all the way through closing eventually. Got it. Got it. Okay. So it was a partnership. You had, there were just really the three of you on this. Correct. Okay. Got it. Cause I know that 1031 ing syndications can be tricky when you've got, you know, 10, 20, 50 investors trying to 1031 uh, that that gets a little crazy, but three, that, that makes a little more sense. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So tell us about that deal in sort of broad strokes. And I'm very interested to hear about management of that. And then let's talk about your new deal going on in, in Georgia. Sure, sure. So the deal, uh, this was back in 2000, I'm trying to, it must've been 14 or so. Um, it was actually owned by someone that did not know how to read or write, which to me okay. was amazing that he was able to purchase a 62 unit deal and was running it fairly well. But as you can imagine, there were really no like books or records. He was just taking money, it was yeah. cash. Um, so it was difficult to get financing to say the least, um, but myself and partners, we were able to get a local bank on board. Collectively, we were able to show a decent track record and balance sheet. Um, so we were able to, I think, distinguish ourselves from a lot of the competition for that reason alone, because we were probably more financeable than, than many pursuing that type of deal. Um, but we ended up closing it. And only 62 units, you know, you're, you're going to get different types of management options. Um, I, I know that especially you guys in the Southeast, you work with some pretty big names. Mm -hmm. down, um, there's no lot, way we're getting Hawthorne or Carlisle <laughs> right. for, for that deal. Right. Uh, so we were forced to work with the local management company. Um, they managed maybe 500 units down there at the time. Um, so we came to them they, and they had a decent, I guess, uh, portfolio as it sat, and we thought they could be a good fit there. Um, I definitely took an active role on the asset management side, would often work with our staff directly that was working. Ultimately, I, I guess I built a strong enough relationship with our maintenance guy who told me, hey, you're... Your property manager um, or the owner of that company has really been dealing with you. He's been, we did some roofs there. So he, as part of that, went to one of the roof vendors and said, Hey, you undercut them here. I'll guarantee you got the job. You pay me, you know, a few thousand dollars of your bid because I'm, I'm going to sort of ring this. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, just pause right there because that's something that there's so many layers to that. So you've got a management company who's, Let's break that down. What are they saying? What What's the arrangement between the management company and the roofing company here? I, I guess they're friends. The owners are right. friends. Right. Okay. And so now the roofing company is is what? They're increasing their bid so, and, and including a slice to, to go to the management company? Is that how that's working? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, not terribly uncommon because no, we had something no. very, very similar happen as well. And um, it's sometimes it's called pay to play. Right. And so, you know, if you want to work on my property, well, you better bump up that bid 20% so that I get my cut. Right. This is, this is the PM saying that, or, or someone that works on the property. Is that what, what you think happened? Exactly. And, and it's frankly, some, you could argue that it's just the cost of doing business. 
Um, but and it's and it's also very difficult to identify in a lot of cases. Um, like yes. I, where you've come across it, it's probably a winding and weaving story to figure out how you absolutely of that. Um, you know, e- even among some of our larger, larger property managers, they're all going to have preferred vendors. And I'm sure there's some sort of arrangement that's going on there. It's just a little bit more accepted. Um, what I, I think irked me was just the, the manner that it was all happening. And, and we're, we'd be all for paying a oversight fee or something to that effect. Um, but it, it, it definitely rubbed us the wrong way and, and was the impetus for a property management change. Yeah. Um, I think disclosing, it makes a huge difference. And a lot of times people don't want to disclose and look, there's relationships. And if the manager has you know enough work for this roofer, then they're probably getting great prices. I mean, that's one of the things we look for from a management company that they do get the best prices because they have so much volume. But you know, also we don't want those undisclosed kickbacks happening because that's where things get a little shady. And we want to make sure that our interests are all aligned for the best uh, health and outcome of the property, not each any individual's pockets, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the property success that's going to make everybody successful. Exactly. Um, I want to ask you a question about the maintenance guy that sort of ratted everything out or sort of told you, like, what what was your relationship like with this person? How had you communicated with them in the past? Is it someone you you know you you took out for lunch when you were in town? Like, tell me tell me a little bit about that relationship. Yeah, and I'll admit my relationship with on-site staff, um, I, I do a better or worse. I, I maintain more of a line than I did then. Then I was definitely interacting with him more directly. Of course, when I was in town, I would take them out to lunch. I think in this case, I was able to understand what was going on because he was fr- fed up and frustrated with the property management company. Got it. And he had enough comfort with me to feel that he would land on his feet if this whole thing went sideways. Um, But, you know, there is something I think to be said for maintaining the lines and reporting lines and all of those things. Um, Absolutely. It's a sort of a tightrope to walk, but I always try to build relationships with every individual staff member on every individual, one of our properties, even if it's five minutes, like before you leave from your site visit and you're just like, Hey, how's your day going? Or what do you think we'd be doing better around here? Right. Give them a, a platform, a, a way to, to speak their mind um, so that they do feel comfortable uh, talking to you next time you're there, pulling you aside or even calling you or about something. Um, I've sent like um, a book on flipping houses. to so one of my maintenance guys who told me he was interested in flipping houses. I'm like, Hey, right. you should read this book. It helped me, you know, and just, little things that don't cost much, but build that relationship. Yeah. And I know that guy, like if there was ever anything going on, he would call me. Right. Cause, cause like we're not friends, but, and he works on my property, but we're friendly enough that we'll text every now and then. And I'll, you know, we have a good relationship that I know now that he's looking out for me. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, we have a leasing person that's like addicted to Starbucks every single day. She's drinking Starbucks at least once. I, we sent her one $50 gift card and like, she's the most loyal person in the world now. It's, it's right. awesome. But it it's doesn't the- take much. And people just want to know they're valued and that they're being heard. And I just wanted to pause on this topic real quick because um, it's definitely something that gets overlooked when we th- think about asset management, we think about running our properties, we think about, you know, returns to our investors and money going for construction and what vendors are working. But at the end of the day, it's the people that work on your property day in and day out, right? The maintenance guys who are interacting with the tenants, they're representing you and the ownership group, right? The leasing staff who they're going into to try to solve a problem with. These are the folks that you have to take care of because they are there every day and they will make a difference. They will call you when someone's skimming off the top, right? (laughs) If you treat them well. Totally agree. It's more people business than anything else. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. And so when people ask me like, why you were just there four weeks ago or six weeks ago, why are you going back? It's like, I have to go back. Even if nothing else has changed, I need to be face-to-face communication with everyone on site. I bring them a box of donuts in the morning, like out to lunch, let's order in some pizzas, whatever it is, just to show like, Hey, we appreciate you guys. So, all right, that's enough on that topic. I love that it worked out for you. Um, and you know, not every time is that going to happen, of course, but it's good to know that you are treating people well. And that if something does come up, someone is going to say, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, Josh probably wants to know about this. Right. Exactly. So, Um, okay. So you decided to, to fire these guys at that point. Is that, is that what happened? Exactly. Exactly. And, and Wade, Wade, bringing on another property manager, 
or possibly bringing the property management in-house. Um, in this case, especially, I had a really strong relationship. There was this leasing person and a maintenance guy. Um, and I felt that I could really just perform property management duties myself from afar. Um, the leasing person was there prior to me. She worked for the other owner. She was a big fan of me, uh, just stepping in and supporting her, paying her more also helped. Um, and so I bought a soft, basically property wear, which is a sort of like the poor man's yardy. Okay. <laughs> and, and got her up to speed on it. I got myself up to speed on it and it was great. I, I mean, we set up bank accounts together and, and it worked. Um, I have very little interest in doing that again, especially. That my next question was, would is, you do that again? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, in this case, I wasn't going to go backwards just because there is a real level of trust um, that you do have to build. And there's a leap of faith that needs to happen with whoever that site manager is that you're working with, where there's not going to be the checks and balances with a property manager overseeing her. Um, and so you had, uh, I just want to make sure I understand the structure here. So you, you got rid of the management company, but you kept the staff, you kept the, the site manager right. and the, the maintenance guy. Right. Right. And were they full-time employees then of, of, of your company that was then, and they only, the only thing they worked on was that property. Right. Yes. Okay. Got it. Understood. Um, and then how did that go? I mean, what, what lessons learned do you have from that over the six years or so that you were doing that? Um, to get this property ready for sale? So it went, I'd say, generally well. If I could pinpoint a, cha- a real challenge that we had while we were, you know, say, self-managing it, it was it was the employee side. Like um, our maintenance person actually had a, um, he had a stroke, unfortunately, and uh, is doing better now, I think. Well, he's doing much better now. But for a while, he was really out of commission. Um so us replacing a maintenance person was really, really difficult. Um, I think that if we were a larger company and can offer some more benefits and at least a past path of growth in a way that we couldn't, I, I think the pool of employees would have been that much better. Um, but we must have gone through, uh, I don't know, probably six different maintenance guys in the year oh trying to find a, a good fit there. Um, so that, that I'd say was the real challenge. I mean, that property, we weren't really doing much to it when that was happening. It was really just turn and operate any of the improvements mm. improvements were done by then. Um, but that's definitely what I would put my finger on. And I, I considered even during that year of switching back and taking on a new property manager. Um, but ultimately, we, we did find a good replacement for Marty. Good, good. Um, so your, your next purchases, the properties you're looking at now, would you consider self-managing or do you normally only use third-party managers? I think we only would if we could build up enough scale in that particular city or market. Um, you know, I, people have different rules of thumb for what that number might be, but right now I don't think we're close in any one specific market where we yeah. could house, um, I think I definitely would um, because I, I, I can't help but be very active on this business and I feel in this just day to day, perhaps, you know, I, I just talking to you, perhaps like you guys do. So I, I think there's, there's a desire at some point, but mm-hmm. the immediate future. I'll tell you, I feel pretty strongly about this and, and it may change when we reach a certain number of units, but I love third party management. I love that I can hire and fire. Not that I want to be firing people, but having the flexibility there is great. Um, but I love that they are the market experts, right? I don't. I am not a expert in property management in North Carolina. I own a lot of property in North Carolina, but I'm not the expert on that. They are, right? They're keeping up with the latest rules and regulations, especially during COVID. I mean, the governor's you know putting out new new whatever every other week. And so they have to stay on top of that. They know what's legal. They're following. They've got the connections to contractors, to attorneys, to whatever resources you need. And then they're also getting scale because they have so many units that they manage. You can get some really good pricing from from vendors Mm -hmm. as well. So I, for now, always love third party. At some point, if we, I don't know what the number is, like you said, 2,000 units, maybe more. Maybe it makes sense if we're there and we have a strong presence, but I'd rather let them run that and let us run, run our side of things too. 
It makes sense. I uh, I would definitely never fault that thought process. <laughs> so tell me, uh, let's get into uh, a little bit before we wrap up. Tell me about the 1031 process um, and, and rolling into this newer deal. Sure. Yeah. So that deal, I think the total equity was like $460,000 only. Um, it ended up being really successful, maybe a combination of time and a combination of, I think, some of the improvements that we made. And, and we bought it right, probably because we were willing to uh, work with some of the less than adequate records, et cetera. Sure. Um, so we had about, it was about 1.2 um, that we were doing a 1031 with. Um, and and in that case, we really wanted to put it into one, a higher quality asset and two, something of a little bit more scale where we could have some uh, efficiencies around it. So we did a tenancy in common um, we set up another entity, basically syndicated the equity for that other entity. Um, and then we came together and bought a 106 unit deal in Atlanta, um, right on sort of North Atlanta, Vining Smyrna area. Got it. So um, any hiccups with the tenant in common? I mean, just tell us a little bit about that process because that's a little bit um, more complex than, than the intro level stuff that, that you read on Bigger Pockets. Tell me about that. Sure. Yep. So a, a, typically it, it, it's not that different. Um, a tenancy in common is basically shared ownership of an asset. So rather than, you know, me, sh- me selling my four unit property, 1031ing it from that four unit into a eight unit, I'm basically fractionalizing the new purchase. So my $1.2 million, I'm buying 15% of this new asset. And then the other call it five and a half million dollars that we're bringing then on the other 85%. My, my, my numbers might be slightly off. That's fine. It's close. We get the idea. That's the idea. Um, it's definitely more costly than a traditional syndication where it's just single LLC managing member, um, GPLP partners, um, because you have a tenancy in common agreement, you have an asset management agreement. And then in our case, we had the, uh, those same documents for the syndicated equity that we have on board. So there's additional entities, additional tax returns, but we were deferring probably three, $400,000 in tax exposure um, were we to not do a 1031. So it made sense um, in that case. Got it. Got to save on those taxes, right? Uh, One of the many beautiful things about real estate investing. Um, Josh, this has been so, so helpful, so educational. Um, I want to give you a moment to promote yourself and, and whatever you have going on. But uh, right after that, you're going to tell me your true multifamily tip. So people have to stay tuned for your true multifamily tip, which is I come to you, Josh, I'm a new investor. I want to get into multifamily apartment investing. What is your advice? But before you give us that advice, tell us uh, where we can find out more about you and anything else you want to promote right now. Sure. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. It's just good to be here in general um, to chat. DXEproperties.com is our website. Um, please do feel free to uh, reach out to us, contact us, set up a call, um, join a newsletter. We do do monthly newsletters, anything from my thoughts to what we're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, and then in terms of my tip for the person starting out, you know, it's, it's always a difficult balance between just uh, when you're going to take that leap. Ultimately, there's going to be unknowns around you. I would just urge you, especially these days when there's just, there's a lot of different uh, voices and talking heads out there about real estate to just take your time, observe, compare. Um, you're, you're not going to miss out on the deal of a lifetime by just, you know, being patient. Uh, so that, that'd be my I, I could not agree more. You know, you don't want to, especially right now, jump into something. You don't want to jump into something that's going to get you in trouble because um, buying it is all fun and exciting when you get to closing. And then now you bought yourself uh, potentially a, a big problem if you're overpaying. You're in so. it. Once you're in <laughs> you're it. In it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Josh, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Guys, if you want Josh's bio connections, all that is up on our website, truemultifamily.show. You'll see all of that up there. Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show and we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to another episode. Check out our website at truemultifamily.show. And if you have an amazing story to tell, share it on our Facebook community and you might just be the next guest on the show. We're also on all other social networks. Just search True Multifamily. 
I'm really, really proud to have this show produced by our company, On Air Brands. Check us out at onairbrands.com. We also have an incredible, unique podcasting event that we would love for you to be a part of. Check that out at podmax.co.